Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our series on Hegel's uh, philosophy of world history. Yes, welcome. Today we'll be doing the end of history. Yes, we've already gotten to the end, it appears. <laughs> <laughs> so previously we did the beginning of history, we did the progress of history, now we're looking at the end of history. Um, maybe we should begin with a disambiguation of this title, the end of history. Mm, yeah, it's probably a good idea to do that now, at the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it doesn't need to take long, really, but one criticism that Hegel is often leveled with, and this can be applied to a lot of his things, uh, on aesthetics, for example, as well, he talks about the end of art, is that in Hegel's system, there are these points where things finish, and and that's considered it's not considered very positively that hegel thinks that there is a point where art finishes and that's it we don't need art anymore or where history finishes and we don't need history anymore and i think it's important to bear in mind that the word that hegel is using is zvek uh, which is aim or purpose and when hegel and here translated as end which it also makes sense in english and I think it's important to bear in mind that for Hegel, the end of history is not where history finishes, but it's this point at which the logical progression of history has uh, has come has completed. It's uh, the idea has fully understood itself, and there's nothing more that it could understand. That doesn't mean that history will not continue, and it will continue. And that's it's just that all that history can be is understood within the beginning the progress and the end of history it, when i say it can be i mean in rational terms in terms in philosophically not empirically mm -hmm. yeah uh do you want to add anything to that yeah so uh it's it's almost like uh well as soon as we start talking of history in terms of progression there is already some sort of end presupposed because the progression is kind of putting forward that it's progressing towards something and that we better know what that is uh so because progress itself kind of seems vacuous or empty if it's just like yeah this is just good this is just um something we should aspire to but then why why is progress something to be uh, uh valued and aspired towards right and hegel thinks that there is some specific content some specific purpose as you as you put it uh, that history is moving to uh, towards or that historical understanding has kind of built within it yeah so i agree yes. that this is the this ambiguity that needs to be put into place yeah uh, and i guess this is this is maybe the kind of thing that people don't like when they talk maybe this is why people don't like talking about the progress or progress in history because it has this idea that we're going towards something um i guess historians or other people from other disciplines don't like the idea that there is an end point or a culminating point uh, a highest point a best point but hegel is is going to say this hegel does think that there is a point in world history human world history where we have reached the pinnacle of self-understanding and rationality and yes and stick with us in this episode to find out <laughs> what that pinnacle is <laughs> it might surprise you <laughs> and this is when the, the screen turns and there's an advertisement now yeah <laughs> Yeah, okay, good. So should we just get into the text then? Yeah, let's, let's dive into it. So the first thing um, kind of that sticks out for me at the beginning of this section is that Hegel speaks about life and nature, that living forms, or that nature also has a progression of living forms, though that higher, well, living forms as such take on a higher level of universal life than, you know, other kind of material forms. And so that there is increasing complexity, you might say, or in Hegel's view, it would be more increasing freedom in existence, but that 
this higher universality still has to be determinate in some way. Mm -hmm. And so it's never that we end up in a place. I think this is kind of flagging the, the nature of this end of history, that it isn't the kind of, uh, uh, well, the universal, if that's the kind of criterion or standard, it is never going to be pure. It's always going to be determinate in some fashion and embodied in some way in some particular situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. He writes, we are standing on the soil of existent beings of natural shapes. A nice rendition of uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm. <laughs> right. Same yeah. idea. But yeah, I mean, the fact that the idea has to actualize itself in externality means that there will be, it will come up against contingency and things that are not I identical to the idea. And yeah, and that means that things will, it will look different. Mm -hmm. But this, this uh, seems to be that, um, Hegel's already kind of warding off uh, against utopian thinking, right? That we'll just end up at the end of history in some harmonious paradise, that everything we're just going to be great, right? Yeah. So it seems to me, so if by utopian thinking, you mean some kind of idealistic thinking about what the end of history would be or yeah. the highest point. Yeah. I think he's definitely warding off against that. His, his point, like, his point that it's going to be determinate and that it's going to be in existence seems to be a way of saying, look, we're not just positing some ideal that we need to reach. It's something that has to be in the world and make sense in the world. Yes, but it is nonetheless an ideal. It's just that it's an ideal that's we could say is rooted somehow still, right? Yeah, in that sense, yeah. Yeah, because I think it is still an ideal, it's still a purpose. Um, do you think maybe this, I mean this is something that maybe makes sense further down the line but would you say it's an ideal in the sense of thinking of what history ought to be like or what the world history ought to be like and then acting in such a way so as to reach it or is an ideal so is it, do you think it's an ideal in that sense so devising what history is and then trying to reach it yeah partially yeah okay but that itself is informed by the current circumstances and the, the present situation right in that that is actual so it seems to me though that hegel would would not want to say that i so the point one of our very first videos on this we said that this is philosophy of world history is fundamentally a retrospective activity. It's something that we can only do having arrived at the end of world history. Mm -hmm. It's not someone in ancient Greece, for example, could not have philosoph could not have philosophized about how history will turn out philosophically. So in that sense, there seems to be something about the project that makes it not idealistic in in a sense in the sense of positing an end and then going for that end in a sort of an in, in a universal sense in the sense of but i think and maybe this is what you're getting at at the same time it does posit some kind of end with respect to individual shapes. So within a particular context, what moves, I guess, the, the society forward would be the idea of what is the best or what is good for the society and then acting in that way. But you're gonna come up against a certain limitation at that point, right? And your society will decline and then something new will appear, something that you couldn't have foreseen. Mm -hmm. what do you think yeah i just mean it's in a much more straightforward sense that uh thinking of history in, in a progression effectively means that you you have a sense that there is a better world out there and then we should work towards it yeah 
Yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah. So on the one hand, on the one extreme, Hegel's not a you know utopic thinker that we can just mm -hmm. reach towards a kind of paradisal, harmonious, free from contradiction state. On mm -hmm. the other hand, he isn't either happy with the status quo, and he thinks there has been real development in history, and that we have learned from history. Um, you know, in ancient uh, Greece and Rome, uh, ethical life and and so on and so forth. That he thinks there's something to modernity that w was underdeveloped in ancient times. That there has been an evolution. So I, I think it's a balancing act, kind yeah. of between these two po extremes, uh, crudely put. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Yeah. Ooh, any anything you want to pick up? From, uh... Yeah, I'm just going through it. I, I'm i making comments on the PDF and I just opened it and for some reason my comments have disappeared. So ah. I'm, I'm looking at it now. Maybe you forgot to save. I thought I did, but probably yes. Well, shall I uh, continue? Meanwhile? If you have something straight away, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's in the same paragraph, uh, still at the beginning, where I, I found that Hegel brings up an interesting image about um, understanding stuff in history. Um, so he talks about how the concept resolves everything and it does so continually. And that had something been able to hold out against thought, it would only be thought itself since it would itself be the object such that it grasps its own self for it is simply what is itself unlimited. So in a strange way, he's kind of saying here that history is all about the stuff that we haven't yet understood about ourselves. Because if we did understand, you know, resolved it, and as he puts it here, then, you know, it wouldn't be interesting. We, we would like, we wouldn't ask ourselves, why did we do that? We would just know. But it seems to be coming up um, in the nature of historical events that something happens an action that is in some way unintelligible or has a mind of its own that we still haven't figured out yet and that the historical examination is in part trying to figure that out such that then it comes into uh the the concept mm. because he does say that the only thing that can withstand the concept is the concept so it's a mind of its own that the present mind is uh, struggling to figure out, but it will figure it out. Yeah. 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 So this, I mean, this must also refer to this idea that the progress of world history is the progress of us understanding world history, right? Yeah. So he puts it as a tribunal of history. <laughs> it would be over and done with, right? If, unless there was this tension. Yeah. And then he says, for judgment is passed only on what does not accord with the concept. But judgment is itself a form of the concept, as we know from the logic. So really what's going on here is a concept against concept, mind against mind. Yeah, but I think what he's getting at, though, right, it must be the concept in actuality, right, in objective form. Which yeah 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 right yeah so th this is why we have to go through it because it's not just all mind and it just automatically thinks itself it's because it's yeah. mind interacting with objectified concepts embodied um, yeah actually embodied yeah. Con yeah yeah that's right and, and so, so this this was actually a really interesting um, section because it 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 clearly presents Hegel as thinking that all of reality is rational uh, there is nothing in reality that is not the concept mm -hmm. yeah um and without being too specific this reminds me of a, a conversation we had a long time ago about uh, the kinds of things that can be known philosophically yeah um since everything is the concept yeah why is there a limitation to what philosophy can know, right? Why is the system what it is? So logic, nature, spirit, and all the stuff in between. Mm -hmm. Why cannot, why isn't it everything? And 
Yeah, maybe this is too niche. Not go on. I think it's too niche. It's my own pet concerns about something. Well, it's in the pet concerns there where the you know the details come out. The, the hairy details. So okay, but, but go on, please. So so as you know, one of my perennial concerns is the philosophy of nature. And uh and Hegel's claim that the philosophy of nature is the sphere of contingency, right? And that's his way of warding off uh concerns that he is trying to deduce everything mm -hmm. in nature, right? So the famous uh, species, how many species of parrots there are, right? And Hegel's response to why philosophy can't deduce that there are 60 odd species of parrot is because, well, because that's just contingent. There's, there's something inbuilt to nature that means that there are some things that we cannot know philosophically. Yeah. And I guess the, and then the question is, well, if it is, if it is all the concept in one form or another, why is there this, this uh, limitation? Why is it that nature is the sphere of contingency such that, why is it that this, why, because contingency doesn't mean, contingency is itself a conceptual category. It's not, the limitation between the conceptual and the non-conceptual and so why is the designation of nature as contingent a good answer for why we cannot know philosophically these sort of more um, particular things like the number of species of parrots so on and so forth uh -huh. yeah and um yeah, this 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 little section just raised that for me again because <laughs> because what one response to this, uh, which is what our, our our good friend and colleague Mert thinks, I think I'm not misrepresenting him, Praise is, is that <laughs> is that um, well there are some parts of reality which are sort of non-rational or not part of the system. Uh -huh. And what philosophy does is it makes explicit the rational parts of reality or what is in itself a concept. But there are other things that are sort of outside that domain and they can't be known philosophically. And that's why they can't be known philosophically. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, here Hegel seems to be saying that everything is rational, not just what can be known philosophically. And so if everything is rational, why are there some things that can't be known philosophically? Do you see? Yeah. My uh, working answer to that is determinacy. It's the nature of determinacy, embodiment, and action. It is a way of closing the concept and uh, for it to make an interiority for itself. So, you know, in you can think of life as an example. It's the thing that sort of generates um, generations of itself. Uh, and members of itself right but each of those members are nonetheless kind of have some sort of agency onto themselves and if you take away the abstraction of life really the individuals is is life itself right it doesn't exist above and beyond those individuals uh it, that are there in the moment i see so it's kind of like you have to take philosophy, which is concerned with the universal, and uh, kind of turn it inside out. Because mm -hmm. what you face is sensuousness, particularity. Um, but that is just, I would, I would think, the concept kind of uh, closed around itself that yeah. has made that interiority, that singularity. So it is form upon form. It's form all the way down yeah but some forms are just more formed than other forms yeah so i think i think that's fine but i think that needs working out i think oh yeah of course it works right? this is just not like working you know uh two sec uh, ten ten second answer to to the question <laughs> but i think that, that that's um that is definitely one way to approach it yeah but but it, i see it here in in the way hegel puts it right yeah 
concept resolves everything, blah, 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 has something to be able to hold out against thought, that would be thought itself, mm. right? So it would be itself the object such as it grasps its own self. Yeah. It is simply what is itself unlimited. So it can think of this in terms of like different historical epochs. Everybody's judging everybody. Everybody looks at their predecessors as inferior, as idiots, as stupid people, right? <laughs> That they were doing something, you know, silly. Look at those silly clothes they wore. They were just like, what is that all that about, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so everybody's kind of immersed and closed around in their own space. Yeah, right. And and Hegel is kind of emphasizing this aspect because this is determinacy. This is the um, uh, the uh, moment of particularity and embodiment. Yeah. But that has the universal within it again, and that is what we are accessing. When we're trying to do, uh, you know, history and then philosophy of history, yeah, trying to figure out the rational, the overarching rationality of all these things and how the bloody hell we can have people in the was it 16th or 17th century wearing these absurd white things around their neck, right? And then yes. move on Ruffles. to a later period where, where old men have like super tight knickers, and it's all about getting the tightest pants possible, right? <laughs> like, what's going on there? But you have people who are in fashion who are studying this as a history right not for that there's a universal going on here and uh, it speaks through these particulars as these particulars are you know words and sentences mm. there's a meaning that gets formed through this that's interesting actually yeah it's true i guess most disciplines would struggle to explain particular individual instances of why something is yeah uh, if they just stuck with the, at that level yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. So well, good. You 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 very helpfully moved us away from my segue in back onto the subject of <laughs> world history. Yeah, we'll have to wait for the next series on the philosophy of nature to get into your you know, <laughs> we get project past properly. The first section. <laughs> um, but yeah, okay. So so in, in two paragraphs down, he talks about an alternative conception of the final end of the world, and I think this is quite interesting as a way of talking about what hegel thinks is the highest end so he talks, talks about, about yeah go on he talks about the good right oh, ah yeah, yeah um and he's he's clearly drawing on some kind of uh it's like the religious idea of the good right so just give a little quotation we find the religious final end expressed as follows, that human beings should attain eternal peace, that they should be sanctified. And amongst some of the reasons that Hegel doesn't really find this very satisfying is that it is fundamentally concerned with the individual. It is our individual quest to find inner peace. Mm -hmm. uh, that then together collectively makes the uh, the good at the final end. And yeah. I suspect this is what Hegel has an issue with this kind of view. Uh, I, su I suspect he's thinking about Christianity in this one. Yeah, that could, be, could be any religion, right? It, yeah, it, yeah, I, yeah, I'm not very well versed in the other ones. But yes, it could, anyone that would fit that description, yes, of an individual of it being the individual's work to find it's a very protestant one maybe as well the individual individual responsibility to better themselves and to find individual peace and if we all do that thereby the, the world sort of ends with the good yeah and we've been talking a lot about the universal yeah as as that thing which is at the core of what moves world history yeah, and the universal is conspicuously absent in this paragraph. Hegel is, and I think this is what concerns Hegel about this kind of view of uh, world history, that it puts everything on the side of the individual. Uh, yet the final end, as thus expressed for, by religion, refers only to the individual subjective side. Mm -hmm. And if the interest of the individual is thus expressed as the final end, then the object or the content of salvation would fall under the heading of means. We can also talk about that. Mm. Yeah. Hegel, well, yeah. Yeah. Go, go on. on. No, please go ahead. Well, so um, 
why does Hegel have a problem with this? Because in one sense, it kind of seems to fulfill the basic intuition about, you know, end of history as, as a, you know, and when we think of things as progress, that we want things to get better. And where, where do we want to go towards? Well, the good. Well, up, you know, why isn't that, you know, it was, it was good enough for Plato. Why isn't it good enough for Hegel? <laughs> so I, That's a really good question, yeah. So, 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 so I think that it, he has to give us a logical reason yeah. why that's not good enough. And what I see from this paragraph is that there's this vague notion of, um, you know, peace and serenity and, and so on. And that means you remove determinacy. And if you mm. remove determinacy, you remove singularity or individuality. And so I, I, what I see this going on here is that this, I, this purpose, this ideal, is setting itself up to sort of a pure universal where they don't really exist. Mm, okay. Yeah. So there is lacking embodiment here. And that, I think, is the crux of Hegel's issue with this, because it isn't, it's just something that's posited in a beyond world, precisely. That's the only place where such a thing can ac actually be, in a beyond world, in a non-actual world. Because you strip away particularities, and therefore you also strip away your individuality. And then your self merges with the big one, you know, and you will have everlasting peace. Great which is about the same as being dead. <laughs> yeah, I think you're definitely onto something there. I mean, he, does, he doesn't like the idea that it's over there, this eternal goal, and that he says that what is here is the place of preparation and attainment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess this is why he doesn't like that. It's the, that, he make, that it makes this life the means for that yep. end over there. Yep. He, he doesn't like that. I think that's definitely true. Mm -hmm. um, and the and the the only where only place this kind of purpose can exist is in a beyond world. There's a there, I think there's a re kind of weird reason for that. That okay, uh, but let's the, how this logic has to work. Okay, let's. I think I think that that is a good logical reason uh, for why that is the case. But let's assume that one also just thought that because he does make a big deal of um, the the interests of the individual as being the final end. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I suspect that Hegel would also not be happy if the, what you posited was not necessarily a beyond, but if the good was whatever was whatever an individual considered as their absolute salvation mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. any reference to it beyond whatever an individual considered to be the good mm -hmm. and it seems to me you know, this, i think this is also part of this criticism here and even if we don't think about a beyond i think it would also it would still be an interesting critic critique because you are not making reference to a general universal. You are, what is, what you are considering as the good is what you take to be the good mm -hmm. and not something that is based on a universal principle. Okay. Right? So it's just you qua individual that, that, that is acting to bring about the good. Mm-hmm. And, and, so is the if i can interject and ask you yeah. do you mean then that the problem here is that really the the issue is that it's all too egotistical it's just what the I think, individual I think, I think, wants you know, regardless of what happens to the others not necessarily no i don't think okay. it's egotistical in, the, in that sense it's egotistical in the sense that it's about individual salvation. That doesn't mean that other people are not to be saved or that you should hurt other people on your, on your path to individual salvation. But it's that the goal is, in, is your salvation. It's not the attainment of a universal principle. 
Okay. The goal is individual instead of being universal. Uh -huh. This doesn't mean that we should make it or punish other people or hurt other people in order to, to reach that goal. But I think the criticism, one of the criticisms here, I think what you mentioned is also correct. But I think one of the other criticisms is this idea that the the one side, the 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 focus on the individual is not how you get is not the interest of world history let's put it that way the focus of the individual is not what moves world history okay yeah yeah so uh, the only way an individual matters in world history is if they bring about an epoch or you know bring out something that is of world historical significance exactly that's but right. in doing that right what they're actualizing is an implicit universality yeah 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 right they're not actualizing their own individuality yeah um so this is like classical evil basically <laughs> yeah like tyranny you mean uh not necessarily tyranny because tyranny means lording over other people but you're just self-centered right mm. uh, you are at uh, you are the most important entity in the in being um yeah i mean i think even if you don't think that though even if you have like this communitarian idea mm -hmm. of salvation and I think still, so by communitarian, I don't mean the salvation of the community. I mean that you have an idea of charity. Let's, let's say charity is a virtue, which it is a virtue, right? And so helping others is good. So part of your individual salvation is also helping others. It, again, it seems to be the problem is that it's an individual uh, aim. Um, what it is what the final end is about an individual salvation, even if you do lots of good for other people on the way. Um, we will see that I think this can, can get you into hot water, Helios, because hmm. nothing ever gets done in history or anywhere. The individual doesn't see, you know, their own um, yeah. incentive or motivation in it. And Hegel has to acknowledge that. And he does acknowledge it. He only, not only acknowledges it, but he, he celebrates it right so uh but i think i think there's a, there's a difference right between what the individual takes their interest to be and how they act upon it and philosophically identifying the end of history th through an individual um ah okay i think i'm starting to get at what what you mean so it's like uh you you put an actual individual as the end of history well in this case the individual is yeah um i would suspect that each of us would be like our, each of our final salvations would be the the end points of history um, yeah so yes, I guess in that sense, it would be putting yourself as the end of history or your salvation as the end of history or as the highest good. Mm -hmm. um, Which is kind of maniacal. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the extremes of this is, is kind of like uh, mad dictators and people who just like right. say that, you know, all of existence is me. Right. I am mm -hmm. I am now Lord Jesus Christ or um you know uh Ra or uh, Odin or whoever, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean or they so, identify themselves as you know the savior of a nation. <laughs> so in the final sentence of this paragraph, for example, right, when he's still sort of critiquing what is just uh explained, mm -hmm. what constitutes the way to the goal is no mere means. But directly the absolute thing that history is about itself, the absolute history in which individuals are only single moments. Which seems a contradictory sentence in a way. Mm. 
Because on the one hand, he says, well, people aren't just mere means to some other state. At the same time as in historical terms, individuals are moments of history. Yeah. He will, I think we, we will catch this out better as we proceed further, because then he starts taking, talking about um, how individuals are the idea. Right. Right. Where the, yeah. We shouldn't think of the universal as above and beyond people, but it's in people. And we have that in virtue of our self-consciousness and intelligence. Yeah. Okay. We're like in we're like in touch with it as a kind of brain or mind, general mind that all minds participate in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Let's move on then. Yeah. So later on, he talks about how spirit's absolute is the absolute of everything, the divine being. Mm-hmm. Spirit's purpose, his absolute drive, is thus to gain a consciousness of this being such that it is known as the one and only actual true being through which everything happens and proceeds. And then how it's actually arranged and blah, blah. Hmm. And this is the power that rules and has ruled the course of world history. So what do you make of that, Elias? So I guess the first question is, what is spirit, right? And we talked about that already. No, I know, but, but in let's the previous just, video. But let's just let's just touch that again very quickly. <laughs> spirit is it's not just the idea, it's not just rationality as such, right? It's embodied idea. It's embodied rationality. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So when we're talking about spirit, we're talking about human beings. Yep. And what they do. Okay. Exactly. That's the important part. Stuff people do. Yeah. It's not stuff people think, which actually never gets into history in the first place. It's what stuff people do. That, yeah. that is what matters. That is what drives this whole show. So spirit's absolute is the absolute of everything. The divine being. Thanks, Hegel. There, there you said it, uh, kids. <laughs> That's the divine being. Okay, so what is what does spirit want to do? He tells us spirit's purpose, its absolute drive is to gain consciousness of this being such that it is known as the one and only actual and true being. So so what is the purpose of, of the activity of human beings? It is to know, I suppose, it is to know their own activity, it is to know their own rationality, or to know the rationality inherent in the world. Or it is well, it is know thyself we're back home back home people where we belong it, it's it's recognizing it's realizing that everything that has happened uh the power that guided and guides the course of world history the power that rules and has ruled it is the idea is spirit is rationality uh, mm -hmm. however we want to put it yeah In the next sentence, we get to this idea about what we do, right? So the recognition of this in these deeds and works is what religion, so here he's emphasizing religion, yeah. rightly expresses by giving God the honor and glory or by glorifying and exalting the truth. Yeah. So I think what's, uh, so Hegel will talk about religion from time to time and giving it points for getting stuff right. And the stuff, the thing that religion get right, gets right here um, seems to me is that it understands that human beings as individuals and as societies are moments are moments of reality they aren't the reality even though it's a you know very fine you know an exciting reality it's not all of reality because there's going to be other human beings other individuals new generations and so on and so forth so there is an understanding there that we're moments and what are we moments of? Well, it seems like a progression. Something mm -hmm. is developing and evolving that spans across individuals and generations. So just to bring this back, so, so, so for religion then, so the comparison with religion is that you have individuals who are honoring the absoluteness of God, right? That's their universality. 
That's yes. their, they're recognizing the universal by honoring and exalting God. Whereas for philosophy, we're honoring and exalting the idea. And that's, that's the universality that we're interested in there. Yeah. So, yes. I, so I would, yeah, I would say that um, religion honoring God and glory is really honoring the universal. Yeah. But it's just seen as represented as God and, and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I wonder if maybe in philosophy, in science, this honoring and glorifying falls falls away because mm. the representations also fall away. We're not so interested in big pictures, you know, stuff with colors and all that. No, just patterns and, you know, logical, mathematical, more like math-like things rather than anything. And how could you honor a number? That's silly. Mm, yeah. So but... there, there, I wonder if once we step into philosophy, honoring and glorifying kind of also falls away because representations fall away. That's a very nice thought. Yes, it goes. Because what are you really exalting? You're exalting a concept. I thought well, you'd be exalting, I guess, the truth, right? Or, or freedom, as he says. Yeah. Um, but it would be odd to honor and glory concepts, as you say. Unless you made representations of it, Unless you which makes it even more absurd, right? How are you going to represent the concept? You know, oh, you yeah. have the cult of the Supreme Being by Robespierre, right? They oh, yeah. tried. That is the silliest thing ever. We should just have lots of statues of Zeus. I mean, that's, the <laughs> only, that's the only reasonable approach. Yeah, yeah, lots and lots of Zeus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, nonetheless, um, it seems like there is a recognition of a greater power there yeah. that uh, spans time and space and makes people into moments. Mm -hmm. But them being moments doesn't deprive them from their dignity and individuality. If anything, it elevates them, actually, because we see every human being as part of the same project now, of the same iteration. I think this is kind of like when we get the really... Um, uh deeper insight into looking at other cultures and other people what their other nations other histories what they've been up to well they've really been figuring out the human project or mm -hmm. the project of the idea if you want to put it in purely philosophical terms yeah yes so what for religion would be knowing like the substantial consciousness of god right so that's how everyone every individual in praising god and honoring god what they realize or what they've been all doing is the same activity of getting to know god i guess or yeah. coming closer to god that that is what we're doing with philosophy yeah we are looking at all the other people that have been doing what we're doing as and understanding them as trying to get at the same thing that we're trying to get at and the reason oh, and the reason that works is because the shared universality yeah. that is there in order for us to make sense of this and each other and even is there when things are alienating and strange to us mm. and, then, and so the culmination of this then is we are spirits the individual is at home not with another but with itself with its essence uh -huh. Not with something contingent, but rather an absolute freedom. And this this is world history. This is the end of world history. So we've re you reach the end of world history when you recognize, when spirit recognizes that it is in entirely with itself, or it relates to itself as itself, not through something else, and that this relation is not something arbitrary. Mm -hmm but something or Hegel calls it absolute freedom. And so like a, a pure self relational, uh, a, a relation that is pure because of this self relation that is uninterrupted between spirit. That's all very abstract. It's very abstract indeed. Yeah. <laughs> but it is but a form of knowledge, right? That's what he emphasizes. Right. It is a form of knowledge. Yes. 
uh, but it's a form of knowledge that is born in the context of people doing stuff because the spirit is doing stuff fundamentally it's people doing stuff yeah and so the kind of knowledge you have to be attaining here is the kind of knowledge that is uh, gets clarity into your own situation about what's around you and that then reflects back on yourself yeah and you know what's around you can extend further in space and time right to mm -hmm. other people other groups of nations or other ep epochs other generations and so on so it all kinds of it becomes a nexus that points back to you in, right right kind of values you hold and and things uh, and the things you do right and then from the final lines you get the idea that hegel is saying and you know once you reach this point it all sort of ties together um the destruction wrought by thought is no longer something alien to it since nothing other stands over against it than thought here too natural death is no longer at hand and the eternal circuit is completed mm. there's there's this idea that having reached the end of history having spirit having understood itself as spirit then sees everything that it has gone through as as itself uh -huh. nothing stands outside of it or yeah. as uh, or as some or nothing appears arbitrary anymore but it's suddenly part of this necessary progression of its own self of its own coming to self-knowledge um mm -hmm. maybe one way of putting it is that basically you get in touch with reality you see you see things for what well, they are but you also see that we're striving towards something we're not just in status quo yeah and so the two perspectives then support one another and that you see oh huh, they, they are supporting one another yeah though i suppose one very interesting question and this we might get to towards maybe the final few videos of the series there must eventually that the, theoretically there must be a point where there must be a point of status quo right where you have reached the end of history uh like things can go worse they can't get better though theoretically right mm -hmm. and and that could be a thorny point for uh for people interested in politics for example yeah uh, um, so one thing that's omitted i find omitted in this section is that hegel speaks of a purpose that is yet to be achieved that is achievable that we're working towards but is yet to be achieved mm -hmm. well and then you rightly ask well what happens when we get there wasn't wouldn't that become a status quo yeah and i think the fundamental logic we're dealing with here has to be of a different nature rather than means and ends okay in some sense the me the end is already achieved in the means mm -hmm. so we're already attaining uh, absolute freedom in 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 a lower degree but there's still more to do about it okay yeah so it's never a situation where we're completely outside of uh spirit and knowing ourselves we are knowing something about us but we don't have exhaustive or like a complete knowledge or a there is a lot of unclarities opaqueness right so it's rather a, a, a of um a progression of kind of going from the minimal to maximum or better but even at the maximum you can think well there's still more that can be done and so in that sense it, it just turns infinite because the purpose is mm -hmm i'm not sure it's realized and can be realized more mm, i'm not sure yeah i think this is this this has to be otherwise you get into that weird you know dilemma you you brought out which is like oh yeah state to be achieved state is achieved well now what right so i think i think what one other way around this and this is maybe this is also picking up your response earlier to my concern about um rationality and how much and why there are limitations to what philosophy can know maybe the point is that 
the sort of the the bare stuff that Hegel will say is the end of history. That's sort of the necessary fundamentals that you need. And then everything else that particular ages or civilizations will think it requires are just more empirically uh, molded things. Um, like the fundamental thing is freedom or yeah. some kind of conception of that, how exactly it plays out. But that That's a very sort of broad thing to say, obviously. Yeah. But I think one way to say, one way would be like, we've reached the end of history because we're all, we're all free in a sense. Yeah. Um, how we then cash out that idea in politics and society, so on and so forth might be one of those things that falls outside the remit of speculative philosophy. It, it's something that political philosophy deals with or politicians deal with. Right. Okay. Um, so we've reached, so, a, so, uh, so I'm saying, yeah, so you, you reach the status quo in a very general sense, but that doesn't mean that there is nothing else to do in more particular cases. Okay. Yeah. I suppose. Mm. Otherwise, I mean, every other part of Hegel's system ends. Uh, it's a bit odd that we should think the world history one doesn't end. Well, well, here, I think here you're conflating end with purpose, which you, you're the self, the kind of good disambiguating at the beginning, right? It's, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you're, you can have a, as a purpose to get fit. Mm -hmm. you can keep that going yeah. you're progressing but it's not a progression where you just like reach a certain state and then you say okay now i'm gonna stop now i've reached it and, and i'm happy you can do that that's fine but that wasn't really the point now was it it was to kind of be active that is as part of your identity or whatever right okay but let's say i continue to be active until i die yeah have i at one point failed to reach the pinnacle of being active the pinnacle like the peak of being active yeah have i have i let's say i'm being active yeah my whole life yeah and i die yeah. have i have i have i failed to reach or to to achieve the concept of being active well you can only know that in in what you did okay right so right. It depends on maybe your specific goal right mm -hmm. well isn't this the same way of world history right it's fundamentally we're looking back and we're trying to discern in what we see yeah the the, the, the progress yeah so either so your goal can be I don't know. Let's say you want to be the strongest man. I, so you lift <laughs> you lift weights, you enter Olympics, and then you lift the thing, <laughs> right? When is it going to be enough? You can win the thing. You can be, you know, world champion. But that doesn't mean the sport ends. That everybody, okay, he's the strongest. We have figured it out. No, there's going to be another guy who says, I'm going to prove it, you know, wrong. I'm going to show it. Actually, there is a stronger person out there. Okay. And here, it all boils down to actuality what becomes embodied. That is what sets, I think, or this, what speaks to, or speaks loudest here. But isn't the problem with these kinds, so I think, isn't the problem though that uh, these are not conceptual limitations. These are empirical limitations, which can always be overcome by another, another person. Uh, whereas a conceptual limitation or a conceptual, or the, the difference between two conceptual points uh at least for hegel right the development of one to the other has to be necessary and so who, yeah yeah but who decides that necessity well the philosopher spoiler presumably. alert <laughs> well the philosopher presumably right nope who decides it passion we will see that next in the next section it doesn't decide passion is it, well it, yeah, hegel says passion is the necessity between the idea and its realization sure yeah but yeah it's not decided in the sense of an arbitrary decision like i'm going to decide to lift 200 kilos 
and someone decides to lift 205 kilos. Well, it might look arbitrary at the beginning when you say, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to decide this. But maybe yeah. that is the, you know, the immediacy of a deeper um, concept that is at work through you. Sure. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. But then it's yeah. conceptually necessary. It's it's not some, it's not it's not like a decision that is taken. It's something that's well. What uh, is deciding the decision? <laughs> so it's not decision in the sense of like I've got like five options in front of me and yeah. I'm going to pick one of them yeah. because I like that most. Yeah. It's it's there is a it's there is a, a necessary path between point A and point B, and I could have gone to C instead of B. That's yeah. fine, yeah. but the connection between A and C is arbitrary, whereas the connection between A and B is necessary. Okay. I don't think you, the necessity can reveal itself a priori. I agree. It's, it's after the facts. Yeah. So you might say you like B, yeah, and that might be part of the reason initially, but then as you do be lots of times and start to enjoy it and you know find that you kind of like it you know and you become good at it then it you know it unfolds into something else and i think that that's when is when you can say oh yeah now it's necessary yeah good yeah. no problem yeah but there are so many parts in hegel's system though where that finishes so like in the end of the logic logic finishes because there's a necessary move from the absolute idea to self externality. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Like there isn't a decision. Not that, there is. There isn't an in between thing that could turn out that. Well, actually, there's another moment here. Uh, may, there, there may very well be. I don't know. But uh, theoretically, according to the system, mm -hmm. logic has finished and philosophy of nature has begun. Yeah. Uh, and it seems that you have the same thing with world history. World history will reach a point where, much like in the, in the logic, where the absolute idea is its sort of self-knowing. Uh, okay, yeah, I see what you mean. I, am, the end, yeah. I, I would think of that as different, different transitions. Because um, okay. when you start doing philosophy of nature, you're doing something a little bit different from pure thinking. Mm -hmm. And just because you come to the end of the absolute idea doesn't mean you can stop thinking about the you know pure thinking. You can keep on going. Yeah, but there are no new concepts to deduce. Uh, could be. Um, that that's a different discussion. But let's say for the sake of argument, there isn't. You can still yeah. go about and think about them. Maybe express them differently. Right. Yeah, of course you can. Um, but the point is, there's nothing new to think about and that's because you've theoretically deduced everything isn't it the same thing with world history isn't it isn't the end of world history the point where there's nothing else to think about with regard to the actualization of spirits self-comprehension okay yeah and so in that sense something else has emerged which is kind of becomes the truth that cannot be um, exhausted in historical terms right and so we need a new framework or new kind of account or a new a development that takes this as its um, the basis whatever has developed right so at the end of the science logic mm. we have the abstract idea and it's throwing itself into otherness well, none of that can be encapsulated or fit within the frame of pure thinking anymore because it's thinking in emptiness. And so it's explicitly not pure thinking. Mm -hmm. So all of the thing we did in the science logic is got to go. And now we got to think of this other thing that's popped out and uh, think of it in, on its own terms, whatever that means. Okay. So why couldn't that be the case with history that ah, something else, a, a new insight has popped out of our historical examination such that we can't keep doing more historical examination to figure out this truth. No, we got to think of it in terms of maybe aesthetics or religion or philosophy or science or whatever else. So that would be a, just a transition. Yeah, that's interesting. But it doesn't need I... to be a direct kind of 
same part of the same project. A one project can maybe spawn a, a new thing, a new object, and then something else has to take over because it doesn't fit back into the thing that spewed it out. Mm. Yeah, I guess I just don't know what that would look like. Um... Well, you know, look at your own life, right? You like to play football. Do you play football all the time? No, you at some point you just stop and say, nah, that's enough today. I want to do something else. You just switch over. Yeah, yeah, I know. But the systems, <laughs> <laughs> the spheres of speculative philosophy are not football. <laughs> they are. No, yeah. Elias, you have to look at speculative philosophy in your own life right now. So I think one, so for one, that's definitely not why Hegel thinks, right? Hegel thinks that the conceptual resources of speculative philosophy come finish at um, well, not, they don't finish in world history. Actually, they fit, they go on to um, the very end of the philosophy of spirit, right? The last few paragraphs, because world you history. That, so, uh, um, are you saying that this is not Hegel's account? So, so at the end of world history, then. If we go yeah. to, if we sort of, sorry, if we, if, if we zoom out a bit, yeah, world history is the final part of objective spirit in the philosophy of spirit, right? That's right. Right. And then we get absolute spirit. Yes. Yeah. Then we've got art, religion, and philosophy. Yes. And so you're saying maybe the further development of world history would be considering all these things that world history can't solve as being solvable through art, religion, or philosophy. Yes, but I wouldn't put it in terms of solvable. It's just that what is more real than world history are these things that are covered right. by aesthetics, religion, and philosophy yeah. or science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so you can that say it's a, a it's a more concrete truth because it's more comprehensive. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe another way to think about this is that the reason something like the science of logic stops is because the pure concept has now become determinate and it has excluded from itself other concepts. That might be another way to think about it. Yeah. yeah. What other concepts has it excluded from itself? The concept of nature, the concept of spirit. Oh, I see. Pure thinking in being expressed as determinate now is just metaphysics, but metaphysics isn't everything. Mm -hmm. I got feelings, man. <laughs> Gotta be able to talk about my feelings. There's no feelings in metaphysics. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man's gotta eat. <laughs> <laughs> All very fair concerns. Yes. Um, but but I think. Yeah. Okay. No, I think I think I get I get your concern, and that is the systematic, kind of. Um, yeah development like how we go from one to the other i think i think yeah. i think at one point we are committed to saying that we have reached an end to world history um <laughs> i think we have to rec because precisely because we could we couldn't do this project without it being finished uh, we have <laughs> to be able to point at a time when world history has reached an end All okay to, again right? I, I i'm gonna i'm gonna say that there has to be a difference between the speculative finishing Mm -hmm. ending of a project in speculative terms and the ending of a project in temporal terms i think ending project in temporal empirical terms is uh is much harder than speculative terms that's a very interesting question actually yeah because it's complicated because because if you apply the specul speculative regime on the empirical regime then at some point states should end art should end but no, they don't. They keep on going, right? But not, yeah, obviously. No, not end in the sense of, but obviously, yeah, we're not talking about ending as no more. We're talking about we should there, must, there must be an instance that has reached that point. Uh -huh. um, otherwise, we wouldn't be able to think about it precisely because we can't a priori deduce yeah. the forms of art or the forms of world history. We have to, they have to have determinate existence. Yeah. And only then can we do philosophy of world history. Yeah. 
tells us that there has been or there must have been a point in world history which was the end of history. Now, that doesn't mean that we haven't gone up and down since then. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean that we can't reach that point again, but it must mean that we have reached that point at some point. I see. Otherwise, I see. we couldn't think it. Uh huh. Okay. I think I get what, what you mean. Um, yeah. I am unsure about that because I want to stick to my Collingwoodian view of scalar forms where you have a minimal and maximum, but you don't have a zero and a complete point. Okay. Uh, that's okay. how I, uh, I like to think about this uh, in a okay. way that makes sense because you're never without freedom as a human being. You're mm -hmm. never not self-conscious or conscious. But that doesn't mean you can't gain insight and new knowledge about yourself and learn stuff. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Shall, uh, shall, we, uh, cl uh, shall we end it for today? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and, and those who have been watching carefully will know that there will be an episode tomorrow or that there will be a next episode. <laughs> there will be a next episode, yes. <laughs> because the end is not really don't, the end. Don't, don't set uh, the empirical uh, in the speculative terms. Uh, yes, you know we can't keep doing it. <laughs> Unless we have the passion. <laughs> Good. All right. Okay. Fantastic. So great discussion. Yeah. Likewise. And uh, thanks for listening in. If you have any comments, ideas, questions, put them in the comments. And if we find them interesting, we'll, uh, we'll discuss it. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Even if we don't, yeah. we might discuss yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. The antithesis. <laughs> <laughs> right. Bye -bye. Have a good one.